the most significant school of thought regarding the IHL obligations of armed groups is that armed groups are bound by the IHL obligations of the state whose territory they operate on, precisely because the state has accepted the rules for the entirety of its territory. Broadly, we can call this a territorial approach. The most important example of a territorial approach is based on the principle of legislative jurisdiction, whereby a state is presumed to be competent to legislate for all the individuals under its jurisdiction. Once a state is bound to respect IHL provisions, those provisions are automatically binding on all the individuals located on its territory, including armed groups. So according to this approach, if a state has ratified the Geneva Conventions and Additional Protocol 2, the provisions contained therein automatically bound the relevant armed groups. The problem is that treaties are concluded between states and normally only impose obligations upon states. To bind individuals or in order for individuals to enjoy rights from treaties, those treaties must normally be implemented by domestic law. But there is an exception, when the treaties are said self-executing. In such a cases, there is no need for domestic law implementing it. Under international law, the self-executing nature of a treaty depends upon the intention of its drafters. We must assess, which is not always an easy task, whether states, when ratifying a treaty, wanted to directly give rights or impose obligations to individuals. All of this was clearly stated in 1929 by the Permanent Court of International Justice, which preceded the actual International Court of Justice. Indeed, the Permanent Court stated, and I quote it, it may be readily admitted that according to a well-established principle of international law, an international agreement cannot, as such, create direct rights and obligations for private individuals. But it cannot be disputed that the very object of an international agreement, according to the intention of the contracting parties, may be the adoption by the parties on some definite rules creating individual rights and obligations and enforceable by the national courts. The main field in which treaties have been considered as self-executing is human rights law. Several provisions of those treaties have indeed been considered as directly giving rights to individuals. However, this does not mean that self-executing treaties could not be relevant in other fields, such as IHL, and with respect to obligations and not only rights, and lastly, with respect to groups of individuals, such as armed groups. In addition, if we look at the negotiating history of IHL treaties, there is a clear evidence that states wanted armed groups to be bound by the obligations contained in the treaties. So it may be argued that the conventional provisions applicable to armed groups have a self-executing nature. However, there are other ways to argue that armed groups are bound by IHL. The most significant alternative approach is the consent approach, which treats armed groups analogously to states in the sense that the basis of obligation is acceptance by the entity in question. What is important is the explicit or implicit acquiescence of those groups themselves to respect IHL. As we'll see in detail in the next video, armed groups conclude special agreements and make declarations whereby they commit themselves to respect certain rules of IHL. Some claim that those agreements 
and declarations amount to international treaties and unilateral acts, respectively. Another way to consider armed groups as bound by IHL on the basis of their consent, or at, le at least acquiescence, is through customary law. But customary law, not based on the practice of states, but on their own practice and only applicable to armed groups. <laughs>